Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, I get to do the intro solo because Stephen is out pursuing other activities. Uh, I am your host, Rob Hirschfeld, uh, with RackN, and today we have a really exciting uh, guest on the show, Erica Windisch, the CTO and co-founder of IOPipe, uh, who has a long and glorious history both in the container space, in OpenStack. You've been around quite a bit, and we are here to hear her opinion about what's going on with serverless and of course, drill down into edge. Erica, do you wanna give a little bit more intro? Uh, sure, um, well, I don't know what to start with. Uh, I mean, I'm, yes, yeah, so I'm the CTO co-founder of IO Pipe. We're doing uh, observ observability for uh, Lambda uh, and serverless applications. Been around for, um, oh my gosh, probably two years now. Did, you know, uh, some, a seed financing round uh, a little over a year ago. We are, um, my, my history, uh, I was with uh, Docker before this, and before that I was uh, at Cloud Scaling, which was a, a company that was acquired by EMC, uh, where we were building uh, OpenStack Clouds. Back when I met Rob, quite, I guess, gosh, that's been a while. <laughs> it's been a lot of years now. So, and one of the things that's always impressed me about you is that you have this this vision for finding sort of where the where the puck is going. I, I actually hate that phrase, but you do it, right? Because you were you know you were open stack. You're like ah oh, Docker. You got super involved, uh, very passionately involved in the importance of containers and Docker really early on. What what made containers interesting to you? You know what what sort of you know latest shiny element pulled pulled you in on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a curse, uh, really. It, it's not a blessing at all. I, I um, have been very good at really, you know, seeing where the puck is going and then, get, you know, and then getting there too early. I hope that's not true with serverless. <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe it is. I, I, I believe I'm, I'm here at the right time. The first time I was in serverless was back in 2010. That was too early. So, you know, having worked with, like, serverless technology really back in 2010, now, I kind of, I did kind of see where the puck was going. I actually knew Solomon back in 2009, where he had showed me Docker uh, then. And it was very different from the Docker that it became. Uh, they had built basically what Docker is kind of today in, in some ways, but it required, um, oh gosh, what was it? Was it Mongo or CouchDB running on your instance host? Like on each host right. they were on? Wow. And it required a bunch of kernel patches. I mean, it was... It, 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 it was it was not run anywhere, right? It was, you know, run anywhere that this whole suite of things that you very difficultly installed, right, um, could, could run on. I mean, in some ways, it was a lot more like OpenStack in its complexity to install than right. Docker that, as it is today. So that's, I mean, this is one of the things that as startup founders you know, you and I both have this ongoing challenge, right? It's that initial experience, the complexity is, is sort of fatal from having people experience what you're building. So, you know, you're, you 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 felt like, you know, did, was there a moment when you're like, all right, they got this experience right? And it, you know, it, it, it transformed what, what's happened? So uh, Solomon gave a demo to me um, back, oh my gosh, I think it was before, the, the PyCon announcement of, of Docker actually, uh, but like literally within like, you know, weeks of that occurring, I was like, this is fantastic. I had some issues with that. I, I had some issues with the security model um, okay. and I eventually, you know, decided to leave cloud scaling to join Docker uh, running their security team. <laughs> ah, um, okay. I remember and, having some conversations about that. Yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, you know, because I, I definitely saw that as being kind of the solution. I, I saw this as solving some really critical problems that we had in the infrastructure space. I mean, I, re I ran a web hosting company for uh, almost a decade. Uh, and I had, you know, experienced the problems of what it was to run, you know, um, a cloud and also understanding to some degree what the user's problems were. I took a lot of experience in building clouds, you know, to cloud scaling and, you know, doing OpenStack. But... Right. The, the problem that I had with my own hosting company was that providing VMs to people wasn't um, an effective solution because it turned out that developers don't know, how, don't know operating systems, right? Like your React developers, your Node.js <laughs> developers don't know things about the kernel. They don't know things about file systems. They don't know right. things about file descriptors and inodes and 
you know, like there's so much to like, you know, like Linux systems uh, and operations that your developers just don't know. And I knew that like OpenStack, like VM orchestration, or at least, you know, uh, Nova uh, was, was not the end goal. Like that was just a stepping stone to the next thing. And, you know, I, I immediately saw Docker as being the next thing. Um, and then uh, with serverless, um, it took me a little longer. It took me a year, you know, from when Amazon kind of showed their POC and, you know, announced it was coming to when it actually came out. And I think I started working on IO pipe, like when Lambda went out of beta within like a month or so after that. And, Is there an aha um, moment for you in that where you saw what was going on with, with Lambda that you're, where you're like, okay, that fixes the problem? There was, but it was actually a little bit after I started working on it. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, <laughs> what was the moment? I was, oh gosh, I was thinking oh, actually a lot about IoT and inventory okay. management. What I kind of came up with was that devices we need to figure out how like we're gonna have many many more devices and we need to figure out how to make those devices secure we have to know where those devices are how to find them how to talk to them what protocols etc right and there's there's this whole discovery inventory and like just so so many challenges here um, i kind of came up with the idea well like okay we just need smaller, more modular code. You know, we need to get away from deploying, you know, servers mm. and containers. We need to get to the point where we're deploying code because it turns out that code can deploy on anything, right? We can deploy code to IoT devices. We can deploy code uh, on the edge, you know, uh, CDN edges, um, on edge devices. We can install them, uh, you know, deep in the infrastructure, you know, as, as services, as microservices or nano services, um, as I'm now right. calling them. I was like, okay, and then I, then I kind of came back across Lambda because I was already familiar with it, knew it existed. But um, when I started looking at building some of these services, I came across Lambda, I'm like, okay, well, Lambda seems to be the right way to build this. And then secondly, it's like, oh, wait, Lambda is kind of a little bit what I'm talking about. Okay. It's just deploying functions. You know, I, I scrapped the idea of trying to, you know, kind of do my own thing and said, okay, like, you know, let's let's go with Lambda. Let's, you know, like run on the Lambda ecosystem because Lambda ecosystem, you know, Amazon's pushing it. Amazon's paying for this, uh, the marketing and the, you know, developer knowledge, you know, the de developer education, right. And then, you know, and then a community started organizing and building around it. And then, it, then they kind of, the next step was, okay, well, this is where the future is going, right. Um, nano services. So the question is what things do we need for nano services? Uh, I started building some of the wrong things <laughs> and figuring out, you know, how those things did and didn't work for them and, and what they actually needed. Monitoring seemed to really fit into a really good place um, it, to, to the degree that we had already built a proof of concept. Do, um, do you want to take a second and explain what, what IOPipe does? Because we sort of jump right. I, I have a tendency I jump right into the, the discussion and, and skip over some of the, the you know, you need to explain what IOPipe does before you jump into the observability and, and yeah. Service. So go ahead. What we do is um, observability into uh, your serverless application. We ingest events. So um, the, the whole stack is event driven. Um, we are not sample based. Uh, we basically collect a set of data, like a key value store uh, for an, you know, a number of, you know, not just metrics, but, data points. So some of those things might be like your Node.js version. There might be uh, things like the HTTP route or the, you know, the user agent for a, re a web request, source IPs for web requests, Kinesis stream names, the number of events. Uh, right. So like Lambda um, gives you an event and it runs a function. It, you know, it invokes a function and calls a function uh, with that event, which is basically like a JSON payload. Um, that, that JSON payload gets processed by the Lambda and the Lambda returns. Depending on what is, cons you know, calling that Lambda, that return value might be used or it might not be used. So with like Kinesis, there's, the return value doesn't do anything. You, you expect that like, so Kinesis is a lot like Kafka. It's a stream of data and it helps you batch requests. You basically batch requests, you might write them to a database for instance. Like, you know, there's no output expected from this. Uh, whereas of course like API Gateway, which is, you know, for web requests, like, 
web requests have responses. Um, so, you know, responses for those method calls, you know, are expected. What we do is we capture the information about the runtime as well as about the events and the responses. Uh, and we give you observability in how those things are running into like, you know, profiling and tracing and, you know, heap snapshots, things like that. Uh, for every invocation, right? So for every method call. So like that monitoring is encapsulated into a single method call. So you basically, for a single method call, you get like a bunch of information, but then you can also see aggregate information and you can also see it like broken out into things like, you know, working on, for instance, process level views or container level views. Um, as well as application level views. It gets really interesting because you get to see things like, you know, memory leaks at a process level that you don't see at an aggregate level across the function. I, I'm trying to figure out, because you are way deep right now in, in how Lambda works, right? We're, um, you know, the rack end, we, we use Lambda as part of our SaaS with a lot of the things you're talking about, right? API, API Gateway and DynamoDB and, and all these pieces around Lambda as, as a core. There's a part of me that says, if you're listening to this podcast and none of this makes sense, <laughs> go learn. You need to know it. It's, it's important. And there's a part of me that wants to provide a little bit of context because so I can ask some, some, some questions specific. So for, for people who just, I'm going to very briefly set some context, right? Lambda fundamentally is an event-based system. Some people would say events as a service or functions as a service. But everything that Lambda is doing is really just event response. And then there's a ton of ways that you can, you can get events in and they have all these different formats. There's a ton of ways that you can take events out. And it's one of those places where if you're I, I talking to, to people in the Kubernetes community who, where there's like a, a thousand serverless platforms blooming, um, which is all cool, but there's no standard for what an event looks like. Um, and there's no even standards on, on how all these things are connected. Lambda is awesome because the ecosystem of inbound event generation is huge and growing. But how do you hook into, like, is there a shim or a place that you can sort of, sort of say, all right, IOPipe is going to listen to all the events. Do they have hooks for that? So the way we do it is uh, you import our module into your application. We provide a decorator, wrapper aspect, whatever you want to call it, um, that, you know, basically wraps around your function. So, you know, okay. we, so, so you basically, so like pass, a, we, we provide you a function, you pass your function to it, we return a function, and that becomes the function that Lambda calls. So Lambda calls our function, and our function calls your function. So it is a wrapper. In Python, okay. it's a decorator. It's a wrapper. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I was thinking, I was, I was starting to think it was like a sidecar function where you would, you know, this, but, but it's a full wrapper, so you can get the input, you can get the output. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and so there's some overhead involved, but it's pretty trivial compared to the benefits of having observability? Uh, yeah, I mean, and also, so uh, we also have like plugins, so you can, um, you know, you can enable certain functionality or keep some disabled. So uh, profiling uh, has a higher overhead, and one of the biggest overheads of profiling is just the fact that you have to be uploading data of the profiling, you know, like the profiling data to like S3. We allow you to directly upload the data to S3. Uploading like eight megabytes of data to S3, um, you know, it takes a few milliseconds from a perspective that's overhead. Um, it happens at the end of the invocation though. So if you're doing something like writing to a database, it doesn't introduce latency. Oh, that's um, an important point. Okay. Yeah, so it introduces time on the return of the function. So you, you've been using a word that to me is, uh, which is observability, um, which generates some, some uh, Twitter war battle on Twitter. <laughs> observability is monitoring, it's not monitoring. It's worth, define observability for me and why, it's, why somebody think, should think about observability when they're building an application. It, it, this is a thing that might, dif you know, the meaning might differ for different people. I mean, I started, you know, my career, oh God, too many years ago. And I remember, um, was it Nagios was a thing. And I was mm -hmm. like, I am not going to use Nagios. And this was like, I mean, oh God, probably 15 years ago, I was like, I'm not going to use Nagios. Nagios is freaking obsolete and horrible. Um, <laughs> and that, that, was, that was my perspective 15 years ago already. And I was like already trying to build, you know, observability, tool, better observability tools. You know, I just don't want, I don't want to just know if a thing is working or not. I want to know 
what it's doing. And I want to know why it's doing those things and where it's putting its information and putting its state. Like, I want to know things beyond just if it's working. I want to know, like, let's say you have a function call and it writes to a database and maybe you didn't write that code atomically. That function uh, errors, you get a stack trace. Fantastic. Uh, did it write some database, some data to the database that, you know, was actually committed, but like you didn't use transactions or maybe you have two different databases. So you can't use transactions. And now you have like, you know, uh, information in some data store that is no longer valid because you didn't, you know, build an atomic uh, operation. Well, that's a thing that like observability might be able to give you that traditional monitoring potentially wouldn't. So is it more about having a, a more complete app stack trace of the application or just more data? What's what, how do you, you know, how do you say, Oh, that's observability and this is just monitoring. What's, is there a, and uh, maybe we don't care. And there's, there's plenty of things that people yeah. ask, like they're, they get very religious about A or B and it's really, a, yeah, whatever. We just... I, I, I mean, I think one thing that we decided early on with IO pipe was, you know, we, we focused on actionable data. Uh, more than we did just providing data to the users. You know, we, we definitely see some, you know, other companies like trying to provide, you know, some, you know, monitoring and or observability for Lambda. You know, we're like, well, you know, yeah, they provided this other metric, you know, and like, you know, we might even have a user like, well, they have this other metric that you don't have. It's like, well, yeah, but we didn't provide that metric because what are you going to do with it? <laughs> right? Um, like, yeah. you know, we, we definitely, you know, we've prioritized providing the most value around the data that we collect, because it's not just about knowing like what your durations are. It's about knowing why your durations are this way, right? So we're trying to provide you know, instrumentation for your application that tells you, well, that, that links to our service and sends us the data, but that, are, you know, that we can be intelligent about and provide you, you know, actual insights for and not just data, right? We like, Makes a lot of sense. I, I would say that like basic monitoring is like time series data as a service. Um, and maybe <laughs> alerting as a service. Okay. You know, observability is, you know, it's intelligence as a service. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of inherent things. So when you, when you first pitched IOPipe to me, right, I was still, you know, very shy on what Lambda, Lambda's value proposition was to uh, one of the things that you know, really struck me was just how opaque the, pro the, the, the system actually could be yeah. and not knowing what knobs to turn. And now that I use it on a regular basis, it's even worse than I was afraid of in a lot of ways, right? You, you, you don't know why a function is working or not working sometimes or why it's slow or not slow. And I, you know, I, I heard a whole... Uh, DevOps presentation about how to tune Dynamo, and I thought I thought the person was nuts. I'm like, who cares? And now I'm using Dynamo, and I'm like, oh goodness, right? You used the wrong index format in your toast. Yeah, so these are these are really real problems that you have in this platform. So yeah, I would so, say, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's actually interesting. I, I would say that maybe some of these problems aren't new, right? Mm -hmm. these, these are old problems, but you know, like there, there's this idea that, you know, well, is DevOps dead? Is, you know, uh, ops dead? Um, right? And, yeah. you know, like with, with, with serverless, because like you're not deploying uh, VMs and containers and bare metal anymore. You're on another level of stack and your level of stack is, you know, my CI runs and it deploys my code, right? But like to developers that in theory has always been the case. The level of abstraction to the developer has been a little different, right? Developer writes some code, they send it to the ops person, the ops person buys a server from Dell, you know, uh, they, they rack it up, or, you know, they, um, you know, somebody in the ops team, you know, figures out how to, sh you know, ship Node.js apps as containers mm -hmm. um, on Kubernetes. Your developers, a very often, even with, you know, your traditional app, uh, architectures are, writing code and it's automatically getting deployed through CI, CD. We're moving and, further and away from the ops experience. Yep. And like your average developer, especially like your, your, your web focused developers um, are not seeing the containers. They're not seeing, right? And what happens mm -hmm. is you need to have tools to help the, um, your developers know what's happening. And with Lambda, 
your operations team doesn't have the traditional tools because they're not running traditional infrastructure they're familiar with. So they can't provide that kind of support they could provide. You know, basically, you know, the, 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 the manpower solution to operations isn't working. Just like manpower solutions to deploying servers and, have, you know, ordering them from Dell manually and racking them and installing them from CDs is no longer an effective solution for operations. You know, managing containers eventually won't be suitable, you know, for operations departments. So what happens is that, you know, your developers, um, you know, in a way are kind of getting the same experience, but you need tools that are application level. And also this application level, you know, application operations yeah. uh, is a thing that was already useful, right? It was just that because you could throw people at it, you could kind of get away without having, you know, this level of visibility or observability. But then because w when you remove, you know, observability of the infrastructure, the app, right. you know, you, you don't have that avenue. So you, you need more of the tooling. That's an interesting, so boy, there's you just said so much. I, I'm like, there's things I want to unpack and, and we're not, I, I have better questions. I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on the like DevOps is dead and things like that. But there, there is one thing I think that's worth piecing out, right? In the serverless framework, the, the, you, you used to be able to go deeper in the stack if you needed to answer a question, right? You still had control with it. And, and I, I feel like you're saying if I'm dealing with serverless and my, my application developers are getting more and more removed from the infrastructure, which they want to do, and that lets them go faster, then they still have to have tools that let them figure out what happened. Because for all the, right, for all of the, the much, as much as we detach a developer from the infrastructure, it's still infrastructure. And they have to be able to observe what's going on and figure out how to debug it and fix it and, and put yeah. their the right lines in and, and get data out or, or put a timestamp in to figure out where there's a bad a bad call. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that uh, I'm seeing today uh, with Lambda is that it makes infrastructure so available and accessible and automatic that developers are very easily building, you know, highly distributed applications that are running into distributed, you know, <laughs> you know like, like they're, they're running into problems with distributed systems problems that, yeah. you know, like developers just didn't and couldn't run into. They were like, oh my God, you know, we need to go buy another machine, um, you know, and like, you know, we need to scale this from three to four. And now developers are going, oh my gosh, um, you know, I'm running, uh, you know, like a, a really small site I built over the weekend. And how do I manage a thousand, you know, different servers connecting to my database simultaneously, right? And like, mm -hmm. that's just not the kind of problem that every developer is running into before. And oh, that's funny, right? So the old days, you could just create, you could craft a Ruby stack and be have a have a server running, and it was single threaded, and databases sort of worked, and everything like ah, uh, whatever, it'll scale up to you know whatever it needs. You know, now on day one, you could actually have a distributed system problem because of the way the the, the lambdas are working in the background. Exactly. Oof. Oh wow. I mean, you get a huge amount of power for it, but then again, you're immediately thrown into distributed system problems and RESTful, RESTful APIs and, and backend, you know, powerful systems. Yeah, I, we, we use Cognito on our stuff, and I can, I, the number of times I would run into walls just like, I don't know how all this stuff fits together, and yeah. you figure it out. And Yeah, and, and also like Lambda, you know, provides a guarantee of at least once execution. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, so in your, so I, I don't want to go. There, I still, there's still more topics. Um, we're gonna have fun. Um, boy. So I'm, I'm gonna, as, as much as I would dig into IOPipe and how IOPipe works, I, I actually want to talk. I want to, I want to pull you towards observability and edge, and get your, get your opinions on edge. I will, I will pause enough to say. If you're doing Lambda, check out IOPipe, see what they're doing, right? Erica and team have been really thinking deeply about these problems, obviously. If you're building an application there, observability and, and actually help, you know, just counting on the, the functions to fire, 
is probably not sufficient to really build a real application. Is that a fair sort of a... Yeah, I think that was fantastic. <laughs> cool, awesome. Um, so Edge. Edge, Edge is something super, we, we do a lot of discussions about Edge. If you're listening to the podcast, we, that's one of our, our themes. Lambda is a topic that people love to say or serverless at the edge makes a ton of sense. I don't think anybody understands what that means. <laughs> um, what, can, you, can you tell us what you think the edge is and, and then I how? Say, which edge? <laughs> yeah, well, that's <laughs> there are many, part there are of many edges and you can cut yourself so, on many of them. Uh, so part of, part of, our, part of the, what we do is we ask guests to define edge for us and then, and then we drill in a little bit deeper. So what's edge? Um, so for me, edge is compute on all of the things. You know, it, it's a microprocessor in, in everything. Um, it, it, it's, it's IoT, but it's also traditional infrastructure. It's also compute on your CDNs. It's compute on your routers. It's compute on your switches. You know, it, it's compute everywhere. You know, and anything that touches data, you know, being able to, you know, to compute there. Um, you know, with obviously, you know, maybe some like limitations. I mean, I would argue I have compute, I, I'm so, well, nobody can see this. <laughs> Uh, the AirBuds, the, the the Apple AirPods, and like there's a microprocessor in these things, you know, and like these things, you know, are like technically internet connected. Like I could ask Siri to like do something right now, and you know, like just walking around my house with my ear with my AirPods or my my AirPods. I, I think the ability for everything to be connected uh, is definitely a part of Edge, and the idea, like that's Edge computing, but I think that like edge delivery software, um, management, DevOps, deployments, things like that is like a huge challenge that we've, I mean, not even cracked the surface of yet. That's, that's where we get excited and where we want to talk about this, right? The, the subset of what you described, I would call IT infrastructure at the edge, right? It's not the device itself. It's, I have a server somewhere, a rack of servers sitting in a cell phone tower, or sitting in my house, or sitting in a colo, and a point of presence in my neighborhood. That IT infrastructure today is very ad hoc, it feels like to me, right? It's a CDN, but the CDN is, you know, there's maybe three CDN systems sitting side by side, right? Netflix's and the broadband companies and somebody else's, and, and who knows, I, there's tons of, tons of discrete components. And then we have this cloud concept of multi-tenancy that sort of should be creeping down into that edge infrastructure, right? That way you could say, oh, I have a function I want to run in a point of presence near my house, but not in my house or in my house. And then I want it to follow me as I, as I go about my day. And, and that function should follow me and hop, right? Site to site where it's not going to run in your phone. It might be too big. Yeah. Is that where, I mean, is that, is that the type of vision that you're seeing or? Yeah. I, I, I think a really great practical example of uh, edge computing today is TensorFlow. You can, uh, you know, you can take, you can build a TensorFlow application and build it and run it um, on the cloud, right? Uh, you know, Google machine learning will take your TensorFlow. Um, you know, Amazon's machine learning will also run TensorFlow, right? And you can build these huge, highly scalable like cloud systems that use machine learning models based on TensorFlow. You can also take the same applications and run them on your mobile device. Uh, mobile, uh, you know, TensorFlow applications do run on mobile. You know, you could take, say, an application and say, like, I don't know, like, on your mobile device, you know, you can, you know, do X number of matches, but if you need more than that, you know, it bursts into the cloud, for instance, right? Uh, and that's, like, a really amazing, like, to me, this, like, kind of, a preview of the future of um, edge computing where you have software that can kind of run anywhere, right? It, it kind of like, you know, what Docker kind of promises, right? You know, build once, run anywhere, but actually runs anywhere, right? You know, like this software will run on your ARM phone or it'll run, you know, on like, you know, TPUs that Google has custom built for, you know, machine learning processes. <laughs> so it, is that because it's code? And, right, because a container is still an operating system in some, you know, not that transparent way. But a function is really just a function. Is, is, is the portability, do you see that as more portable? Oh, absolutely. 
And this is a, a conversation I had with folks back in the OpenStack days. I, I thought this, I, I was naive to think we would go straight to it, right? You know, because like I saw we were going to this model and I was like, you know, I, I thought that, you know, Linux is dead and it's still dead. It, I mean, Linux is it's seriously dying. We don't, I mean, we can run code, right? Like, if we can ship and deploy code, and that code is portable, if it's like TensorFlow, and that code runs on your mobile device, and it runs in the cloud, and it runs on FPGAs, where is Linux, right? Like, you know, it, like, Linux is irrelevant. I mean, Linux is uh, full of security problems and, uh, you know, legacy architecture and legacy design. It's just a disaster. Linus is a disaster. <laughs> you know, I'm really looking forward to the point where, you know, we're not looking at operating systems all, all anymore. We're definitely a few years away from it, but um, I, I expect we'll, we'll get to a future where even, you know, our soft or our CPUs are in software. So Erica, this is, this is where I love having conversations to you because <laughs> You, you lay it out, and I'm like, well, wait a second, and then we, we can go at it. And I, 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 there's things you're saying I'd, I'd love to tear into. Um, yeah. Not, not from a – well, to me, what, what you're describing, and I totally agree with and, and totally disagree with at the same time, is that, there's, there's abstract, that people are moving into abstraction boundaries where they don't care anymore about operating systems and hardware and things like that. And we should celebrate that. I think that is awesome. And I think you're right, right? If we can take code and move it into a place where I don't care about the operating system, that's an amazing thing. The place I disagree is that there people still need to care. Somebody somewhere, maybe fewer people still care about an operating system or a server or something running. Yeah. So, I mean, there's still, we're, I think the DevOps is dead. I, I, don't, I don't want to get too distracted because I, want to, I still want to go back to Edge but the DevOps is dead or operating systems are dead or things like that, are that our abstraction boundaries are getting more firm in some cases. And I think cloud is driving that, but that's yeah. right. Cause right, I don't know how- I, 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 th I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's definitely becoming firm along the boundaries that are mature. I think that what's happening is, you know, we're kind of removing boundaries over time but the boundaries that exist become firmer, but then also eventually disappear, right? Like as they become known and become firm, they actually get removed in, in many cases. So I, I think that um, okay. we're, we're getting to a point, like unikernels, for instance, like if you could just run Node.js directly as your kernel, you don't need Linux, right? If you can run, like, you know, if you had like a Node.js OS or you had a, you know, um, a Java OS, if you had, like, you don't need Linux. And at some point, you don't need the container, right? Because like, you could compile, uh, like all the stuff that Docker does, I mean, like, those are all things that could be part of the microkernel. They could all be part of, you know, the, the OS. Like eventually, right, as we improve these pieces, we remove them. You know, it's, so it's important in necessary optimizations. It's going to take a while, but it's going to be really interesting to watch it. <laughs> so you're, you're making me think back to, we did an immutable infrastructure panel and you were a guest on that panel. Yes. Um, I, and I will refer, we'll, we'll make sure that's in the show notes so people can find it. Cause you laid out some, some pieces like that. I want to go back cause what you're saying about abstractions and boundaries to me is a, is a question for the edge. Yeah. Because, because what, what you're saying is I have compute everywhere. Right in an IoT device, in my in my ears, in my earphones, I have in my switch, in my right. Is functionless or function as a service or serverless compute the 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 portability unit for that? Does that allow us to stop caring where something's running? I, I think it's a really important step to get there. I don't think uh, you know serverless has a maturity of an abstraction yet that makes that quite possible. Um, Amazon Greengrass is a compelling uh, proof of concept of this. You, know, and, you, and want maybe, tell, you want to explain what Greengrass is for people who, who've never heard of it? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, so Greengrass um, is you know, a, a, a lamb, an Amazon Lambda runtime that runs on IoT devices. And you know, I, I call it a proof of concept because you know, it's definitely a thing that um, 
Amazon's get, get getting increasingly better at pushing out proof of concepts around, uh, especially around the Lambda stuff, where, you know, they build a thing, they show it off, they release it, you know, and it, it's not necessarily 100% usable up front. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's maybe an MVP or a proof of concept. It's a thing that shows, yes, you can run Lambda on IoT devices. But when you talk to IoT developers, they tell you that, great, but there's no OS that runs Greengrass out of the box. And, you know, nobody wants to go build an OS to run Greengrass on. At that point, they've already just wrote a firmware. Uh, they might as well just put their code in the firmware that they just wrote, right? Sure. So, like, they're, you know, and, and uh, Amazon just announced uh, RTOS at um, you know, Amazon RTOS at reInvent, which has Greengrass built in. So, you know, like, they, they kind of are working on that, right? And, and moving from kind of that proof of concept into product uh, or at least you know a more widely available and usable <laughs> product you know that means that like you have code potentially that could run on your iot device could run on your cloud front distribution and can run as a nano service on aws lambda wow so i mean and we we need to there's so many places where i want to go but we're, we're running out of time and i need to wrap up the podcast so, I mean, this is, this is amazing because, right, this is just a tiny, small piece of, of, of Amazon trying to get their own thing right. And yet, it doesn't speak to a whole, you know, platform that could be bigger than what the cloud is. So it's, you know, because that's just, that's just green grass. It's just Lambda. It doesn't describe standardizing events and doing events that are more generic to infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it feels to me like the events are more of a challenge. Getting event standardization is going to be more of a challenge than the actual platforms. Yes. A, so, the, so when I first launched IO Pipe, that was, that was kind of my thesis was okay. we're going to have a big problem around understanding these events <laughs> uh, and doing things with them. Mm. So I start, so IO Pipe, like my initial proof of concept was basically um, allowing developers to write the code that manages events and then understand that code so that develop, so if somebody wrote something that handles an event, yay, we understand the event. Uh, now, now we don't have to write code that understands that event anymore. And we can compose the code together, you know, to basically do what we wanted to do with that thing, right? So the, the idea was like, you know, if we can basically understand these data structures automatically uh, through the way that developers are working with these uh, data structures, then we don't have to have standardization around these pieces. That would be a huge deal. Because I know from firsthand experience, right, the first thing you do when you're writing a Lambda, you're looking up what's the JSON that it's sending me? Oh my God, why is it so different than the last, than the other service sending me JSON? Yeah, and if you have some way to help insulate the developer from the event, cognitive dissonance between events is not, it's, but it's, it's, it's it, you know, the, the, the Venn diagram of events looks, you know, completely non-overlapped. It's, it's, it's infuriating. Yeah. And if you can help uh, with I mean, that, we ended up moving away from that. It, it turned out in order to understand how developers were processing events, we had to have monitoring and that was enough mm -hmm. of a challenge. Although we're now giving users like more visibility in, into those events. So like we're getting to a point where you know, we can definitely help users with these things. Uh, we, we can't solve them for them automatically as m maybe I would have preferred. Uh, the CNCF, uh, there is um, a, an effort to standardize event sources, which is a, a compelling and interesting thing that is developing. I think it's definitely better than what Amazon's done. Amazon event sources are pretty unusual. I think like, for instance, <laughs> a CloudFront request, like, so an event for a CloudFront request is a single element array. <laughs> Yeah, like every time, there's never more than one element. Of it's always security. an array with one element. <laughs> uh, yeah, Amazon, Amazon is a single company, but not a single platform from that perspective. So yeah, I, I would encourage people to look at what's going on with CNCF and start you know, participating there. Uh, you're, you're, Erica's bringing up a really good point, right? This is something we need to be collaborating on, thinking about, because it's really hard to put the genie back in the bottle for standardization. We, sh we, we should be able to start piecing it together a little bit uh, from that perspective. But, all right, I, I have a list of things that we're not gonna be able to talk about. <laughs> 
Um, which is fine. That's I, I, that means we've had a, a, a great conversation, and I've had to bite my tongue a whole bunch on on interesting things. Um, I'll, I'll parenthetically throw out the one that, that I keep wanting, kept wanting to get back to, and we'll save for another day, which is the security aspect of uh, of, of all of this stuff, because that's where you started, and I know that that's another 30-minute conversation. So people have to wait and come back or engage us online. Erica, how should people who want to learn more about you or want to uh, interact with you, what's their, what's their avenue? So uh, iopipe.com and you can, uh, you know, you can reach out, uh, you know, you know, hit us on intercom on our website. I mean, you, I guess you could probably hit me up on Twitter. I'm eWinish on Twitter. Uh, the company is iopipes with an S uh, on Twitter. The company doesn't have an S. Uh, it just, you know, twi twi Twitter name conflict. Yeah, that, yeah, that's basically it. Any, you know, any shows reach out, or, uh, to, either to me yeah. or to our sales team or whatever, you know, appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. It's been a pleasure. We had, this was great. Thank you. All right.